French um, distortion. That means you're dealing directly with the unknown. You can go one way or the other easily, and if you're um, um, in need of a, of a quick decision, the regress prevents it. So this tends to make people throw their hands up in the air and just declare entire subjects as taboo and you know, off limit. But. Oh, here's a, an interesting concept that um, has sort of guided me, um, especially after the book uh, The End of Science came out. That if we're in the um, end times of science and there's no new revolution, uh, revolutionary uh, discoveries possible, well, you look around and there aren't any new um, revolutions coming along. And there's articles about why are there no new Einsteins. And suppose you met a time traveler from 50 or 100 years in the future and said, you guys are crazy. You didn't discover X or Y or Z that um, all of physics is this, this tiny little bit of, of um, progress compared to these giant discoveries that are going to happen in 20 years. And everyone's complaining there's not any new Einsteins. Well, they're all sort of being crushed. That anyone who comes up with something weird can't get funding. So if you think that you're in the end times, you end up being in the end times because the certainty that you're in the end times puts you in the end times. Everything is suppressed and you've come up to sort of an asymptote to um, stasis where there's no more progress. But everyone's convinced there's no work of progress, so anything that, that looks like progress doesn't get funded. Because since there's no progress possible, anything that looks like progress is actually crackpotism and heresy. There's nothing up there to explore. So anyone who wants to go up there is crazy. You don't fund crazy people. <laughs> but it's a, a closed loop of, of um, belief causing reality and reality causing belief. And if everyone thought that we were at the lowest end of the, um, the, the great exponential curve of physics discovery, then you'd have little kids making giant discoveries and people taking them seriously when they find their website that they are the new, new, the new Einstein. So it's possible that there are many new Einsteins and they're all in the crackpot community <laughs> publishing on the web because no journal would ever take their papers. And you might have people that um, they have flying anti-gravity cars and time machines that really work, but they've never built them because you can't do this stuff um, as an individual. That You need major money for most anything. Um, and, and at least you have to be able to quit your day job to work full time. And so funding controls what happens. If you fund um, bold leaps out to the unknown, you start boldly leaping out to the unknown. And if you only fund small inter, 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 um, um, intermittent progress, then that's what everything ends up being. So I think, yeah, in a few years, we'll, we'll in, have invented the, the X device, and everything will be completely different. Um, Oh, here's another idea. Einstein was an Einstein denier. <laughs> he came from the crackpot community. Okay. He couldn't get a job. The, um, af after graduating, he almost starved to death and, uh, until someone took pity on him and um, had a talk with somebody at the patent office. So here's this unknown um, crackpot submitting papers. He's not associated with that, any um, academic um, group. And they actually took him seriously. Things were different back in um, um, the turn of the century. But if you had, have somebody working a day job has nothing to do with physics and sending in physics papers, and they're the, the, um, um, the miracle year, today would any of them be accepted? They're not on a university letterhead. So um, Einstein was from the crackpot um, community, but nobody ever says that. It's sort of after the fact, he's redefined to have always been a scientist all along. So that way they can say that the crackpot community will never ever produce anything because anyone who does produce anything, well, they were a scientist who was hiding in the crackpot community. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing that, um, happened with the Wright brothers. The, they're um, bicycle um, company owners. They, they don't have any connection with any um, ac academia. And they break, do the breakthrough that um, come, brings up human flight and control their <coughs> aircraft. So now they're defined as always having been scientists, that they built the first wind tunnel and were doing rigorous testing. 
So they weren't crackpots along with all the thousands of other flying machine crackpots at the time that were being um, horrendously ridiculed. The, the Wright brothers couldn't make any headway in the United States and their breakthrough actually came not at Kitty Hawk, but when they took their flying machine to France and flew it at a crackpot flying machine convention. <laughs> they had people that, could, that actually had machines that were sort of like the leather bat wing steam powered thing that would fly in a straight line. And the, the Wright brothers came and flew rings around them, literally. I think that's probably where the expression comes from. But no longer crackpots. They must have been scientists all along. So how do you make a difference? Uh, I don't know because um, right now anyone who comes up with really revolutionary stuff makes the experts look stupid and the experts are in control of funding. So massive changes would have to happen in um, peer review because right now it's completely um, conflicts of interest. In politics, any kind of conflict of interest um, makes all the bells ring and the red lights flash, but in science you have uh, people in the same niche group determining your funding or um, going the opposite way that rivals can destroy your funding if, if they're, they're um, um, dishonestly judging your stuff harshly when, just because it's a threat to their own work. But that's um, the wrong checks and balances. It should be people from outside of the niche group um, in any part of science that determine what gets funded. That you don't have um, people that are completely um, ignorant of the, of the group. So we have uh, science, maybe scientists from another topic field that determine the funding. Well, that's been suggested. Another one is um, having sort of a science court that, that um, hears cases. Um, recently, the NIH actually did that. that they had several million dollars um, to put into odd research, and people could make applications to this um, NIH Science Court for medical research. I don't know if they're still, do <coughs> still doing that, but um, I haven't heard if any big breakthroughs came through. But uh, centralized funding seems to be a, a big problem because you can't find any funding source except the big ones. Um, Thomas Gold pointed that out, that, that there used to be around um, World War II and before all kinds of different little odds funding sources, and if the big ones didn't want you, that you uh, very often could find some out of the way um, um, place that, that was um, supporting science. And last is um, polywater. If people have heard of the polywater controversy in the 70s, I think it was, because uh, I remember seeing that in sci um, popular science, that a Russian group and then American group had found a new form of water, they thought, in very small capillaries that was extremely viscous, as if the um, water molecules were lining up in chains. And um, they could only get tiny samples because it only worked in these uh, very small capillaries. But it worked out many um, characteristics of it. And then the whole thing came to a halt because it was accused that they were mistaking um, sodium silicate for all of the effects, that silica was diffusing out of the glass surface. So polywater became a completely taboo subject and nobody could touch it and it was um, um, obviously disproved. And right now at the University of uh, Washington where I work, Gerald Pollack is pulling down large funding for his polywater team. And he, uh, from the things that they, the breakthroughs they made in biology because of polywater, it's Nobel Prize quality stuff. So he may be up for something like that. But they can't call it polywater. <laughs> yeah, it's polymerized water. It's if you have um, um, the ions on the surface of proteins, that water lines up in shells over and over, and they found that this goes out to many millimeters. Their basic um, demonstration is if you have a layer of gel and then a distilled water full of silt of um, latex suspended microspheres. So it's sort of like milk. The, uh, the gel will organize the water and push the microspheres along as if it's growing ice, but there's no ice. It's a new state of water, and it'll grow up to um, um, millimeters. And he's coming out with a book on the thing. He proposed to the Obama administration to start a um, $7 billion science funding organization 
that only funds breakthrough revolutionary stuff. 